Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Leap Year webinar or live Q&A with Winona Doctors. I guess we're not calling it a webinar anymore. <laughs> I'm Angela. I work at Winona. I'm sure you've seen me before. If you haven't, hello, welcome. Um, and I'm here with two of our favorite Winona physicians, Dr. Green and Dr. Kat, who I'm going to let introduce themselves here in just a second. And while we're doing that, everybody, please start putting your questions into the chat. Um, we want to know what your questions are, and we can't answer them if you don't put them in the chat. So please go ahead and start doing that. And I'm going to let Dr. Kat take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kat Brown. Um, I'm a Winona doctor in the state of Pennsylvania and in Florida, and also now caring for patients in Hawaii as well. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about myself, I was in the army for 12 years. So I moved around the country a little bit. I have had experience taking care of women at all phases of their, of their life. Um, but now really focusing on midlife um, and women going through perimenopause and menopause here at Winona. So happy to answer all your questions. Um, so, so please put those questions in there. Otherwise we're going to have a really um, interesting conversation where the three of us are just going to talk. <laughs> so and that's, that's not what I so. We can actually <laughs> fill up the time, but it won't, you won't like it. <laughs> yeah. True, true. So my name is Mike Green. Uh, I'm uh, OBGYN. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer of Winona. And by the way, um, Dr. Kat is now our Medical Director of Winona. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, and um, so I'm in a hotel room. I'm actually uh, on the road. I do um, training for uh, Nexponon, which is an implantable birth control device. And the FDA says to use it, you have to go to a training. And I'm the guy you got to go through. So <laughs> I'm going to have to leave a little bit early. I'm training a bunch of doctors on um, how to do this procedure in a little while. Um, so that's my funky background. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, I've been a OBGYN forever, um, for, gee, I got my, I finished residency in 99. So I've spent most of my life doing women's health. Um, and it's really a joy and, um, it's super exciting to be able to increase access to care, um, through telehealth and particularly with HRT, where sometimes it's really difficult, uh, to get that prescription, uh, because people they get blown off by the doctors or the doctors are afraid to prescribe it, or there's just a lot of misinformation out there. So we're really happy to be able to serve you that way um, and try to make this more available for people. So please um, type your questions in. So, cause that's what we're here for to answer your questions. And I think Angela, we've got one um, in your pocket, right? <laughs> yeah, we have, a, we have a special one. It's a write-in. Somebody messaged our, our patient services team and said they couldn't attend and they had a question. So I'm going to share it with you. You both can do your magic. Tell us what you think. Um, the question is from uh, a patient named Brooke, or maybe she's a TBD patient. But the question is, <laughs> um, can you please address the ladies with no uterus or ovaries, whether we should or should not add progesterone to our estrogen replacement? So the, the easy answer for this is that when you don't have a uterus, you really don't need the progesterone part of HRT. You know, the main, the main purpose of the progesterone is to counterbalance the effects of estrogen on the uterus. So what I like to tell patients is estrogen has so many beneficial effects throughout the body, but the one negative effect it can have is it can make the lining of the uterus or the endometrium overgrow, which can lead to um, what we call hyperplasia, which could lead to cancer if not you know, found um, early, but basically the progesterone helps to counterbalance that effect. So for women that still have a uterus, we need to give them progesterone anytime we give them estrogen to prevent that from happening. So if you've had your uterus removed, you technically don't need progesterone. Um, I do have some patients now and again that, you know, say that they really just want to take progesterone, but there's some data out there that if you don't need it, it, it can actually you know, be more risky to take additional hormones that you don't really need medically. Now, you mentioned um, in the question, you know, th this woman mentioned hysterectomy and ovaries. So the other thing that's important to talk about too, is that when someone goes through a hysterectomy, and a lot of our patients will say they've had a hysterectomy, and they think it means everything. So people will say partial hysterectomy or total hysterectomy. But the word hysterectomy just means removal of the uterus. So for us medically as OBGYNs, if somebody's had their ovaries removed, we call that an oophorectomy. If they've had their fallopian tubes removed, we call it a salpingectomy. 
But when someone goes through that big surgery where they have all of their female reproductive organs removed, they can go through a sudden surgical menopause. And it's really important when that happens that we do give them HRT, especially if that's done at a young age, um, because it's very important for us to have the benefits of estrogen um, until the point where our body would have naturally re you know, reduced its production. So if a woman goes through a hysterectomy and oophorectomy at age 35, she absolutely needs HRT, at least until she gets to age 50, if not longer. So that's important to recognize too. So when you, if you're going through the process of maybe becoming one of our patients, that's one of the questions in our onboarding questionnaire, because we need to know as your doctor, do you have a uterus? Do you have ovaries? We want to know what's involved so that we know what, what to prescribe for you safely. So it's important to know your terminology, right? Yes. <laughs> and well, in the onboarding, we try to make it um, user-friendly because we know that, um, you know, not everybody knows what a oophorectomy or a salpingectomy is. So um, it, it'll be, if you haven't done it yet, it'll be pretty clear, you know. Did they yeah, take it'll say, have you had your uterus removed? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And hopefully you know if you've had it removed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Dr. Green, is there a light in your room that you could turn on? Because half of your face is in the door. Yeah, I see that. I'm going to, let me, let me see if I can adjust things. Sorry, I just want like the full glow of Dr. Green on the screen so you can see your face. And I'm sure the editing team will I mean, appreciate it later. Oh, I that. Is that better or worse? Yeah, that's better. Yes, okay. better. There yeah, you I go. Like the opera thing happening where we're like, Yeah, I know. I was looking at that. I'm like, oh, should I get up and change that? But so I'm glad you said that. <laughs> no, now we see the full glow of Dr. Green. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's better, but. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. We're going to start with these questions. So everybody get ready. Here we go. Um, okay. Cynthia would like to know if you can combine different forms of estradiol. So technically you can. Um, specifically, I think I have a lot of patients that take systemic estradiol, but also use vaginal estradiol. That's probably the most common um, combination that I see because Vaginal estrogen um, really is only absorbed locally, so it really just helps the vaginal tissue. So if you're, even if you're on systemic HRT, you can actually take vaginal as well. So a lot of patients will combine the two for, for the benefits that they can get from that. Okay. Um, next question. Melanie is saying her insurance is telling her she needs a billing CPT code. Do we know if Winona is covered by insurance? This is an easy one. <laughs> this is an easy one. So it's not an easy one, actually. Well, I think it is an easy one. I mean, because we, we don't bill insurance directly. And the reason is we want patients to have access to the care right away. Um, because insurances, there's a, a lot of red tape and a lot of things that we have to go through prior authorizations. You know, like you're mentioning a CPT code. So we have patients that can, you know, if you have an FSA or an HSA card associated with your insurance, you can use that to purchase the medication. And then also we're able to give patients itemized receipts to submit to their insurance for reimbursement later if they wanna to try to do that as well. But we're a direct to patient um, service. So, you know, you're gonna pay for the medications directly and then you could always try to get it reimbursed later. By the way, that receipt has a CPT code. Um, yes. <laughs> so it's on there. So if you're, if you can't find it, um, just uh, send a message to patient services and they'll um, direct you to the downloadable receipt that includes a CPT code. One of the problems with insurance, um, they are famous for setting up flaming hoops. And as you jump through it, they set up a second flaming hoop and a third and a fourth until you finally go away so that they don't have to pay. So I found that the more stuff that they want, the less likely they are to ever reimburse you. So at some point it just gets ridiculous, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, CPT code is on the receipt that you can download. So um, it's there for you. Awesome. This is a helpful tip. Even I didn't know that. Um, okay. <laughs> so Sarah would like to know, what tips do you have for someone who's just starting out? She just ordered the cream. Well, I think that um, before starting your HRT, if you've never been on it before, what you can do preemptively and preparing to start is to start thinking about other lifestyle changes that you could make that will also help the HRT to work even better for you. So if you haven't already and you're going through a, starting to have these symptoms of perimenopause or menopause, try to work on sleep hygiene, try to work on optimizing your sleep. 
I really try to encourage patients to really focus on their nutrition and really trying to get healthy, fresh foods as much as possible. And, and even you know, adding any kind of movement in to your day to day, you know, you don't have to be a gym goer, you don't have to do an hour workout five days a week with the perfect gym clothes and everything, but just little changes that you can do to add movement to every day, whether it be taking the stairs instead of an elevator at work or parking further away from the grocery store, start thinking about bigger life changes that you can make that are going to complement and help your journey in addition to the HRT. So that's what I would do in preparation for starting the meds if you haven't already. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jules would like to know, uh, she says, I've started using HRT for bone density, but is interested in its neuroprotective effects, particularly for our brains, since 75% of people with Alzheimer's are women. Are there any experiences to share with that? So that's a interesting, there's been some mixed stuff on that. I think that I don't personally think the jury's out. I think that the overwhelming data is pretty clear that it does help with dementia and particularly Alzheimer's. Um, there was a study that came out last year that made headlines that kind of shook things up a little bit. Um, but the, the, I think the majority of the studies do show that it does help for brain health, particularly for prevention of Alzheimer's. So besides the osteoporosis benefit, I think you're going to get the Alzheimer's benefit as well and okay. cardiovascular benefit so there's lots of benefits besides just by the fact that it helps you feel a lot better which is a big benefit but there's also a lot of behind the scenes things um the cardiovascular benefit the alzheimer's benefit the osteoporosis benefit um decreased risk of colon cancer and when done correctly decreased risk of uterine cancer um so uh and if you're coming to one own it'll be done correctly so that's good <laughs> that's true uh, especially your bones. I think that's such a big one. No one thinks about the bones, but when you break one, <laughs> it's not pleasant. Um, yeah. No one wants osteopenia or osteoporosis. So uh, good thing to have HRT. Okay. Heidi has, so she has fibroids in her uterus, two that are three centimeters and six centimeters. Should she worry that they're going to get worse or might they get better? Well, so in general, fibroids tend to become less symptomatic in menopause um, as our body's natural production of hormones decreases because typically fibroids are fed by hormones. So often, you know, in, in younger women, we'll use birth control to try to regulate the growth of fibroids um, by suppressing hormones. Um, so for most patients, especially if you're symptomatic from your fibroids, if they're causing heavy bleeding, if they're causing pain, that typically gets better in menopause. Most women, the fibroids will reduce in size during menopause. And typically the doses that we give of HRT are not going to like reactivate the fibroids or make them grow significantly. So I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. That's good. Uh, Melanie says she's heard some say that the patch slash pill has been more effective for them versus the cream. Is there a difference? Well, the, the main difference between patches and creams and pills is in the absorption of the medication. So typically the transdermal methods are the through the skin, whether you're putting a patch on that sticks to the skin um, consistently or whether you're applying a cream, the medication is getting absorbed by the skin and going right into the bloodstream. Whereas if you take a pill, it has to get broken down by your stomach, get filtered by the liver before it gets to the intended tissues and gets into the bloodstream. So that's the main difference. But honestly, each method is just as effective as another. And, and it's really a matter of what a woman prefers and, and what she can fit into her lifestyle the best. So if you are somebody who already takes pills every day and just adding another pill to the regimen or your routine each day would be easiest, that works a lot for, it works very well for a lot of my patients. Whereas other patients find that they wanna do a cream, it tends to work better for them. So sometimes it's a bit, a bit of trial and error too, trying to figure out what works best for you. And, and so we can switch things around if need be, if you try one, and it doesn't end up working out, we can always switch it later too. Okay. Uh, we have a general question. I don't know who wants to take this because it, it might take a sec. Uh, Jay wants to know if you could please give an overview of how HRT works. Wow. HRT or Winona, I guess. Well, maybe both. <laughs> and or Jay, you can clarify, but. So, well, we could start talking about how does Winona work 
um, and then we could expand it to how H HRT works. But so if you're interested and you're not already one of our patients, what you do is you just go to our website, buywinona.com. Um, you'll fill out, start the adaptive online questionnaire. Basically, you'll find out if we're in your state um, and then you'll start answering medical history questions for us and giving us a clear picture of your medical background. We want to know what medications you're on, what medical problems you've had in the past. Like we mentioned earlier, we want to know if you've had a hysterectomy or not, if you still have your ovaries or not. Um, and then after that, you'll have a section where it'll ask you, you know, what type of medication you're most interested in, cream, patch, pill. Um, and then once you've complete that onboarding questionnaire, your information gets forwarded to one of our doctors in the state you know, that's licensed in the state that you live in. And so then the doctor will review your you know, answers to those questions. They may contact you with some further clarifying questions. Um, if you want to talk to the doctor or message with them um, before you get a prescription, there's a, an area in the onboarding questionnaire for you to do that too. But if everything is pretty, um, pretty clear cut and you are a good candidate and you don't have any further questions and you're ready to get started, sometimes we'll review everything and find and everything is you know where we want it to be and we'll order your medication for you and send you instructions for that um so that's that's kind of the basic way how winona works um so hrt how hrt works basically is that we're giving you doses of hormones that your body would naturally produce on its own that it's starting to decrease the production of which that's why the majority of patients are starting to notice symptoms and so the symptoms can start off very differently for many different women um, sometimes the first thing we see is menstrual irregularities so women in their 40s will start to notice like their period all of a sudden is going haywire gets chaotic you don't know when you're going to get your period when you're not you might skip months you might have two in a month sometimes it'll get heavier than it had been in the past whereas you may have been a clockwork 28 day cycle girl and then all of a sudden things are just not predictable and then the next thing we usually see is problems with vaginal dryness or insomnia brain fog and then also you might start to develop the hot flashes and night sweats um, mood changes as well. You know, you might be in a very loving relationship and then all of a sudden you can't stand your partner anymore. <laughs> That's pretty common. I hear from a lot of patients. So these are all symptoms that are indicative that your body's own natural production of hormones is ramping down and decreasing and it's causing these symptoms. So HRT, you know, by giving you hormone replacement and specifically we're giving you bioidentical hormone replacement, we're giving you hormones that your body would naturally produce on its own. Um, and giving you a little bit of those hormones back to kind of help you deal with those symptoms and help this transition to be a little bit smoother. So that's a really good answer. <laughs> Very good answer. <laughs> Your turn to talk, Dr. Green. So yeah, I want to add, since I built the onboarding, um, sometimes people are, are surprised how short it is. Um, and um, that's on purpose. And the reason is, actually, it took me a while to figure this out and to tone it down you know if you if you've been to a doctor's office recently as a new patient they give you a book to fill out right all kinds of crazy stuff that they're never going to look at anyway quite honestly right and mostly because the government says they have to ask all these questions um and then somebody puts in the computer and then nobody ever looks at it again but if they get audited they can say yeah we did what we were supposed to do um and so we don't have to worry about that. That's another advantage of not taking insurance is we kind of keep the government off our back and we can do medicine the way that needs to be done for the patient. And, you know, we can communicate back and forth without having to involve the government. So that's one of the nice things about it. Um, but so basically I designed this to ask everything I need to know and nothing I don't, um, which is different than what you fill out at the doctor's office. Quite honestly, you know, if you sprained your ankle when you were seven, it's kind of irrelevant now um and so i don't need to know that and so there's a lot of stuff that you get that we get used to being asked as a patient um that we don't ask you because it's honestly not important um i was actually recently a new patient uh and had to go through this and i was kind of laughing when i was filling this out it's like no one's ever going to look at this like i'm having surgery on my finger you know nobody's going to care about you know all these like crazy things that happened to me 30 years ago um and so we don't ask all that stuff and so it, it kind of gets it, it it takes a little getting used to and some people as they after they're done going through the onboarding they kind of get this like is that it 
Um, but trust me, we've asked everything we need to do to safely do this and do it well um, without all the irrelevant stuff that you're so used to being asked. So, um, so just kind of a, a little thing. And then um, there is kind of a reveal. So we've, uh, we built this algorithm um, and it took a while to really hone it in. It took about a thousand patients, um, but I think we've got it down pretty good. And it will recommend uh, a prescription for you um, based on all your stuff. Uh, and then, you know, you can say, yeah, that looks great or no, I want to think about something else. And then when the doctor reviews it, the doctor can change it too and say, you know what, this is what the algorithm chose, but I think you might do better with this so that you may get that as well. But for the most part, I think it works pretty well. Um, it's kind of a helpful tool. So you will get to see that as well. It's kind of an exciting little reveal during the onboarding. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what you'll see and, and, and sort of the thought behind it. Fantastic. Okay, we have a, a popular question. So everyone in the chat who asked the question about weight gain, this is the time for you to listen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> managing I thought it was going to be about. I thought it was going to be about tests. <laughs> See, yeah. managing the expectations across the board. Um, okay, so the question is, <clears throat> what should I believe about weight gain in perimenopause? With so much information out there or misinformation out there. What do you believe? What do you not believe? And what's your advice? Well, I think that we do know based on looking at data and taking care of patients throughout our careers that there is definitely a difference in the perimenopausal time frame and menopause where women's body composition changes. And most often it, it relates to, you know, weight gain, especially around the middle. Um, and really it's because of cortisol and stress levels is what we really find is that, you know, all of a sudden you're getting all these symptoms, the hormones are changing and suddenly your body is like in a fight or flight state. And so your body is holding on to every calorie it can, despite you wanting it to do the otherwise. <laughs> and so we tend to accumulate that weight in the middle in the midsection. And that's why there's a nickname for it. And it's called meno belly. So it's, it's very, very common for women to experience that. And so most of the time when that happens, um, you know, just all the things you maybe could do in the past to try to lose weight no longer work because this is really hormonally driven. So really when you start HRT, initially you might not see weight loss right away because we're trying to get your hormones balanced and trying to get a steady state of the, of the hormone in your system. But normally you get relief from your other symptoms first. And then what we usually find is that once your hormones are optimized and once the HRT is a good dose, like we find that sweet spot where your, your symptoms are better, that's when you start to notice the weight loss starting to come. So it's, it's one of those things that you have to be dedicated to and you can't, um, can't check the scale every single day the first month or two <laughs> of starting HRT. In fact, I mean, we, we do see patients get a little bit of bloating and, and water retention and a little bit of weight gain that could be temporary in the beginning as their body adjusts to the medication. So my best advice is to stay away from the scale initially and focus on how you feel um, because the weight loss will come later. But it, it's very, very common for that meno belly to develop. Okay. Question, the next question. Um, if you have dense breasts or a history of post- menopausal breast cancer on both sides of your family is HRT recommended? Well, so the only way we would say that you are not a candidate for HRT is if you've personally had breast cancer. So having a family history of breast cancer doesn't disqualify you for being able to take HRT. Um, and a lot of a lot of patients and a lot of physicians actually out there that are afraid to prescribe HRT are worried about the risk of breast cancer. But actually the leading cause of death for women is actually not breast cancer at all. It's actually heart disease. So, you know, we're afraid of this thing, especially with a family history, but um, you know, it's not generally, if, if you develop breast cancer, it may not necessarily be from the HRT. And so you are certainly a candidate to still try it and to still, you know, give it a chance to see if it'll help you. So, and if you want to add anything to that, Dr. Green. So yeah, um, this was actually kind of a surprise when I really kind of dug deep and looked into this, but there's some really good data that a family history of breast cancer is not a problem for women for HRT. Um, and in fact, what's really interesting is everybody thinks it's the estrogen that causes a problem. Um, but women that have had a hysterectomy and are on estrogen only HRT 
do not have an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, women that are on combined HRT, estrogen, and progesterone have a slight increased risk of breast cancer, but it's so much made up for by the decreased risk of cardiovascular disease that people that start HRT before they're 60 that are appropriate candidates live longer, healthier lives than women that have never been on HRT. Um, so, you know, there's kind of the, the thing out there. There's one statement you can make that pretty much everyone in the world will agree with, and that is everybody has to die at least once, right? So, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you're still going to die someday, even if you take your HRT. But the idea is to try to put that off as long as you can with a healthy life. And HRT is going to help you do that. Um, and so you have to look at the, at the big picture. It's also another reason why I try to drag my feet um, in women that have had their uterus removed if they want progesterone. It's like, try the estrogen first because it kind of takes that risk away. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it's another one of these things that why add an extra hormone if we don't have to. But um, HRT is much safer than people think it is. Uh, I remember telling my wife, it's like, you know, the, the risk of HRT is way less than the risk of birth control pills. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised that she was surprised because she's not in the medical field. She says, really? I said, yeah. Like it's much less, much less risk than birth control pills. And yet, you know, a lot of people get put on birth control pills, you know, for their menopause symptoms by their good meaning doctor, because it's what they're used to prescribing, but it's actually doesn't work as well. And it has a lot more risk. So that's kind of the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. We have another, is it not really a question? It's on the topic of weight gain. Somebody else is sort of adding in their comment that they're hoping that Winona will help them to lose weight because they've gained weight in menopause. And even though they're working out several times a week and doing the Weight Watchers and the whole nine, that they're slowly starting to gain even with diet and exercise, but they're in their mid fifties. So kind of just speaking to more of what you were both saying about <laughs> how you can approach weight loss in, in menopause and perimenopause. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty common problem and um, it's frustrating because it takes a while to really see the benefits. I had someone message in today. She's been on the medicine for two weeks and she hasn't lost any weight. It's like, yeah, that's kind of what I expect. Um, it takes time and that's frustrating because, you know, it's like I want it and I want it now. Right. Um, but if you hang in there, it does work, um, particularly for the, for the type of weight that people gain in menopause. Now, honestly, you know, if you've been obese your whole life, it's probably not going to reverse that. But the waking that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, what happened? I turned 45 or 50 or 38 or whatever. And out of nowhere, I put all this weight on in my middle where I never put it on before. It can really help with that. Okay. We have another, um, and I don't know the name of this person because it looks like maybe they're using a work. <laughs> <laughs> name, but the Melton team at EXP Realty <laughs> would like to know. <laughs> There's a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> Those who, um, uh, so whoever this person is would like to know. Um, they started the 50-50 cream and 25 milligrams of DHEA, and they're regularly getting their period without skipping. And they're saying that their cycle started early this month by about three days. The anxiety is worse than before and the cramps are bad and they want to know if it's going to get better the longer they're on their medication. Yes, gen generally it will. So for women that are still having regular menstrual cycles, you can expect that when you first start HRT, you might notice some minor changes to your bleeding. So the period may come a little bit earlier. I've had patients where the period comes a little bit later and they've even skipped a period when they're, you know, depending on when in your cycle you start your HRT. So th this is something that's generally temporary. It's, it's a adjustment period that your body is making um, and adjusting to the hormones. So it, it will level out over time. Okay, good. Um, all right, we have a very simple question, which is what are the benefits of HRT for women over 50? Well, we touched on that a little bit um, earlier. So, so for women, I mean, really the benefits are, are great when you started as early as you need it. Um, but for women over 50, especially as our own natural body's production of estrogen is decreasing, by adding HRT in, we're helping to maintain your bone strength, bone density, so preventing osteopenia, osteoporosis from developing. Um, also, there's beneficial effects in the brain, like we mentioned, 
you know, the prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but also the cardioprotective effects as well. So estrogen helps to make all the tissues in the body healthier, it makes tissues more elastic. So that also equates to the tissues in the heart and the vessels around the heart as well. So um, it's very, very beneficial for that as well. Um, and if you're somebody who, you know, sex is an important part of life. So HRT also helps with the vaginal tissue as well. So helps with vaginal dryness. Um, so if you, when you lose estrogen, the vagina starts to get changes and what we call now a genitourinary sy syndrome of menopause, basically where the vagina, vaginal walls get thinner, they get less elastic, um, not as supple and, and more prone to injury or tearing. Um, and so, you know, by taking HRT, you keep your vagina younger so that you can have better sex longer. That's important too. <laughs> So it also uh, it also can help the skin and the hair. So it'll yes. um, help prevent wrinkles, keep your skin looking younger, your hair over time. And these are changes sometimes that take a while, um, but should become thicker and healthier with HRT. So that's a mm -hmm. another nice little advantage. Bonus. Okay. Uh, the next question, Melanie says, for someone that's in menopause but only experiencing muscle mass loss and collagen loss, is it still helpful? Yes, it is. For those very reasons, we were just talking about the help in the skin and the hair, um, you know, and that's that can really help with them, you know, with as far as the collagen as well. But the DHEA as well can help with the muscle mass and help to maintain muscle. Um, the other important part of that, too, is that, you know, in trying to eat healthy and maintain nutrition, it's important for you to make sure you're getting enough protein, especially if you want to maintain your muscle mass. So, and I know there's not a lot of women that want to go out and be like bodybuilders, but, you know, um, just to maintain the muscle and the strength that you have to stay strong and to keep your bones strong and your body strong to prevent, you know, falling and, and fractures and things like that as we get older. Let me, I'm going to touch on that because that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, going to the gym and lifting weights and doing resistance is actually a really good exercise um, for men and women. Um, and um, it helps with, um, you know, prevent osteopenia, it helps with muscle mass. Um, there's kind of this thing, it's like, well, I don't want to do that because like, I don't want to get huge muscles. Like, believe me, people that have huge muscles work really hard to get this huge muscles. Yes. <laughs> Nobody goes to the gym and then all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, I got these giant muscles I didn't want. Um, so yeah, you don't have to be afraid of that. Um, we always laugh about that in the gym. My wife and I, um, we, uh, we lift weights together, uh, three times a week. We do the same exercises together and she doesn't look like, you know, Mrs. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> yeah, she still looks like, a, you know, but if that's what you, the look you want, you know, you can, you can get that too. Um, and, uh, but it takes a lot of work. So nobody like goes to the gym and accidentally they wake up one morning like, Oh my God, I got giant muscles. It just, <laughs> I wish that would happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It really does help though. I mean, even with the, I mean, I notice myself like already muscle loss, which on the one end you go like, oh, my clothes in some weird places fit better because you, but you're losing muscle. You're, you know, which is not a good thing, but doing some weightlifting, like light weight lifting is, is actually really beneficial. And I'm also one of those people who doesn't want to have big arms or legs as a result, but you don't, you really don't. It's, it's pretty safe here to say firsthand experience. Yeah. Not to mention that yeah. doing, doing weight training and resistance training also helps to boost your metabolic rate too. So, you know, when you're working your muscles and making them stronger, they're using, you know, more energy for fuel, your, your metabolism is better. So that helps with the weight loss as well. So, you know, it's, it's better than just straightforward, just going and doing cardio all the time. And I think, you know, the, the pendulum has swung where, you know, years ago, women were doing cardio like crazy. There was all these step aerobic classes and all these things that to, for people to do. But now we realize that weight training is actually the key, you know, to really helping to boost your metabolism and to make your body stronger and healthier. Okay, I'm going to skip this comment just because it circles back to the somebody was mentioning that they gave us the wrong size of their fibroids, that it was the size of a lemon. So I don't remember what the reference was before what the size was, but they wanted to correct the size of their fibroids. FYI. Um, okay, Cynthia is wanting to know um, if she can adjust the time that she takes estrogen to help with night sweats. Like, should she take it at noon instead of eight? Or is that something you can switch up? 
Well, for most patients that have night sweats as a predominant bothersome symptom, actually taking it at nighttime would actually be better because then it can help to work while you're sleeping to prevent night sweats. So often we'll recommend starting the estrogen in the evening for a lot of patients. Um, and we can tweak that as needed depending on how your body responds. But yeah, it's taking also, it later in the day can help. Yeah, it's also totally okay to experiment and see what works best for your body. This is not like birth control pills where it's important to take it at the same time every day or it won't work. Um, you can kind of play around with it. It's important to take it every day, but um, but you can try different times of the day and see what works for you because it's amazing how individual this is. Um, everyone kind of responds a little bit differently and trying out different things like that is okay. Do you have to do it? This is just me asking. Do you have to do it for a longer, like if you want to switch it, you have to give it a chance for like a week or something before you would then adjust it to something else or can you switch it like day to day? I would give it some time, except that if you, let's say you switch the time and you're just absolutely miserable, it's like, okay, we'll go back to what worked. But, um, but it can take time to really see how it's going to affect your body. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Um, someone who's interested in the estrogen patch and they want to know, does it enter the bloodstream as much as oral estrogen and DIM if we've heard of it? <laughs> Our yeah. favorite question, <laughs> the DIM question. The, the patch does enter the bloodstream just as much as oral estrogen, if not better, because what we mentioned earlier is that the transdermal methods, you know, get absorbed through the skin right into the bloodstream. They don't have to bypass the stomach or the liver before they get absorbed. So, you know, the estrogen is actually getting into your bloodstream a little bit more directly than it would if you take a, a pill, an oral estrogen pill. Yeah, and the, the DIM supplement seems to be very popular amongst a lot of our patients, isn't it, Dr. Green? Yeah, <laughs> yeah get me started. I know. I mean, there's, there's a lot of supplements that many companies out there are unfortunately getting a lot of your money for, ladies, that are really unnecessary. So the DIM, which I forget what it stands for, it's like dye, indole, methane, something or other, I'm not sure, but it's supposed to be a supplement that's supposed to help your estrogen metabolism and it's supposed to help your body process estrogen. So, you know, I've, I've had patients that have come to us that have been on DIM for a year and really haven't noticed any benefit from it. And then they ask me if they should continue taking it. And my answer always is, well, if you had no benefit from it, why would you want to continue taking it when you start your HRT? Like a lot of times patients start HRT with us and then they realize all this stuff that they've been spending money on to try to help with their menopausal symptoms not is really not necessary anymore. That often they can stop paying out of pocket for a lot of these other supplements. Yeah, some of the lists I see are tremendous. It's like, how do you remember to take all of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, um, I think calcium is probably a good thing for most women to take. Um, and it, if you eat really well, you probably don't need a multivitamin, but you know, if you, if you, if you don't always eat really well, a good multivitamin, but don't spend a lot of money on that, go, go to Costco and get the Kirkland one. Um, <laughs> and you know, that's about it really. Um, there, it, you know, there's really not a whole lot of supplements that, um, well, first of all, most of them don't have a lot of studies behind them. DHEA is an exception. It's actually an extremely well studied supplement, uh, which is why it's the one supplement we offer. But um, most of all those things, they all have these funny names too. Um, but uh, most of them really don't have a lot of science behind them. So if, you know, there's a placebo benefit, that's great. So if you like it and you want to stay on it, it's probably safe, but it's probably not necessary. Mm -hmm. I think the trigger is that anything that puts metabolism in the title, everybody goes, ooh, <laughs> it's going to help my metabolism. I'm going to buy it, right? So we're all suckers to marketing. Well, DIM is marketed as it, it, uh, it, it metabolizes the bad estrogen, which I'm not really sure what the bad estrogen is because <laughs> you don't really have that. Um, there's only three estrogens in the human body and none of them are bad. So um, I'm not quite sure how it's supposed to work. The bad estrogen. Yeah. Mar it's all marketing, everyone in this chat. Marketing. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, Michelle, this is a really important question. Um, and my answer in advance of the doctors is come to Winona. Um, the question is, my current primary care provider is blowing off my perimenopause concerns, weight gain, brain fog, mood swings, discourages HRT, saying it causes breast cancer. 
how can I find a doctor <laughs> who will take me seriously? I'm 57, never been pregnant in eight years since my last period. You are exactly the reason why we exist. That, that, that paragraph right there is exactly why Winona is here because unfortunately there are way too many providers and physicians across the country that are scared of HRT, you know, that don't have the experience with it or not comfortable prescribing it. And unfortunately, patients like you are, are at a disservice as a result. Um, the one big plug I would put in here, though, is that if you're going to your doctor or any provider, whether it be a nurse practitioner or PA, and you have concerns, legitimate concerns, whether it's menopause or not, and you don't feel listened to and you don't feel like they're taking your concerns seriously, do not ever be afraid to find a new provider. I mean, if you just don't hear, if you don't feel like they're hearing you, they're not listening to you, why keep going back if you really don't think that they're taking your concerns seriously? So that that's my one big thing. You know, you want to find a doctor who's going to listen and who's going to help address your concerns. So, but we, that's why we are here at Winona. So if, if your doctor is great for other stuff and you have to have a cold or flu and they do great with that, but they just don't want to do HRT, come to Winona for your HRT. We can help you here. <laughs> well, we'll take you seriously and we'll yes. listen to you. This is what we do. <laughs> we're gaslighting at Winona. Just so you know, <laughs> I'm a patient. No one gaslights me. I promise it's not a plug. Um, okay. Jen would like us to answer. I think we've answered this, but we're going to, I'm going to read it anyway. Um, she just started the creams two to three weeks ago in DHEA this past week. During her most recent period, she had more cramps than usual and wants to know if it's a typical side effect and if it will get better. Yes. Right. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. Like we talked about, I think a couple questions ago when someone was asking about like their period coming earlier and having more cramping, that's your body responding to the new hormones in your system. And so that will get better with time. Okay. This is a good question. I mean, I think we get asked this periodically, but I know there's still some confusion for people about whether or not if you're not in full menopause, um, but you're close and you wonder if you should start HRT before you're actually a year from having missed a, a year of consecutive periods. Um, and also as a higher risk of, for breast cancer, she's saying her mom had it three times, does HRT exacerbate estrogen receptor breast cancer risk? Which one do you want to take? You opened your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> let me take the, uh, let me take the, um, do we have to wait till we're in menopause? Because it's a, it's so interesting because I get both sides of it. If there are people that aren't quite in menopause yet and they're like, well, is it too early? Or there, there's a lot of doctors out there. Again, this is why we're here where they say, oh, you can't have HRT until you've gone a year without a period. Um, and then I get the other side where people it's like, well, I'm in full menopause now, so I guess it's too late. <laughs> and the answer is it's not too, it's, it's okay for both of you. Um, for the, first of all, there's a lot of benefit to being on HRT. Um, and the earlier you start it, the more you get that benefit, the cardiovascular benefit we were talking about, the osteoporosis, the Alzheimer's, all of that. Um, but on top of that, you're not feeling well. Um, so HRT can help you get your life back. Um, and so why wait? Um, if you know, it's like, you got a pneumonia, but it's only in one lobe. So we're going to hold off on the antibiotics until like you're almost dead. Like, why would you do that? So if it, it's okay to start the HRT before you're in full blown menopause, in fact, it's better to start it that way. Not only is, are there health benefits, um, but why be miserable? Um, so, you know, you only get one life. Um, and so you might as well start feeling better as soon as you can. And for those of you that are already in menopause, um, it's not too late either. Um, and so there's still a lot of benefit to be had. So um, it can help um, on both sides. I think the other important part of that too is that a lot of both providers and women think that like there's this switch, like this all or none, that when menopause happens, suddenly your hormones just plummet and take a nosedive. But it's actually happening over time. Like it's happening over a 10 year period, you know, where, you know, your symptoms can start up to 10 years before that final period happens. And so over that time, your estrogen is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Like with other medical problems, like when someone gets pre-diabetes, we don't wait until they're in full-blown diabetes and going into diabetic shock that we treat them, right? 
So same thing with these hormones. So why would you wait until you're completely depleted and until things are really gotten bad when you know that they're decreasing over time, we can supplement with HRT and help that transition while your body's natural hormones are, are decreasing over time. Mm -hmm. okay. So I am going to have to, add that. <laughs> I just got a text <laughs> from the rep asking when I was going to be there. So, um, so I am, uh, I'm, I need to uh, sign off, but I'm leaving you in very capable hands. Um, I've got to go train some people on a birth control method because um, we do things besides menopause. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of my other hats. So uh, thank you all uh, for coming. I hope uh, this is helpful and keep asking your good questions and I'll see you guys later. Thank you, Dr. Good luck with the next plan training. <laughs> yes. so, we'll see you soon. And I think the other part of that patient's question was about their risk of breast cancer. So, yeah. So if, if you have a family history of breast cancer, you're still a candidate for HRT. Um, but if you have a personal history of breast cancer in those situations, then, you know, that's when we'd be a little bit more reticent in prescribing if you've personally had any type of cancer. So it doesn't matter if your family member's cancer was estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive. Um, you still are a candidate and, and we can talk about the risks and benefits with you. If you decide to go through the onboarding process, we can talk to you about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a pretty basic question that I do not know the answer to because I luckily do not have to pay for my HRT at Winona because I work here. <laughs> How much is a doctor's appointment, Dr. Kat? So technically there is no cost to have like the initial onboarding and the discussion with your doctor at Winona. So the only thing you're going to pay for on our platform is your prescriptions. So the important thing is that um, we are an asynchronous telemedicine platform. So unlike some other telemedicine visits that you may have had with providers, especially during COVID, you don't have to schedule a video visit. You don't have to schedule a specific time. We have an ongoing um, ability to, to write back and forth, your, you and your doctor. So basically you ask your questions, your doctor will respond, um, and we basically message back and forth. And that, that's how we communicate. Um, and so there is no cost for a specific doctor's appointment on our platform. Okay. Um, the next question, Nita wants to know if there's a good time to apply the cream and or take the capsules i personally think that um most women start out using the cream at night and they tend to like that the best because it it helps with sleep it helps with the night sweats um, and then for the dhea so you can really take it at any time you want to but the way that our body releases its own natural dhea is usually early in the morning so i personally like to take mine in the morning and i think it works better for a lot of patients to take it in the morning because the dhea really helps to give you energy throughout the day. It helps to combat fatigue. Um, and so that's something that for me helps me more during the day. So I usually recommend to patients to try to take it in the morning. Okay. I mean, is there anything that prohibits you if you forget to take it in the morning to take it in the middle of the afternoon? No, you can take it whenever you remember. <laughs> that's what you say at two o'clock. I was like, oh, I didn't remember to take this today. I'm going to take it right now. I've been doing that as I recall, like whenever some days I skip it, not because I mean to, but that happens also. Mm -hmm. And so far I'm still here on the planet. So <laughs> all is well. Um, okay. The next question, Amy, so she's on HRT testosterone pellet form. It's placed every 12 weeks and is on progesterone oral 200 milligrams, but can't stand oral estrogen DIM smells horrible <laughs> options like the patch. She's also a factor five but never blood clots and also has tested because her mom has it. Uh, oh wait, it goes on. Um, she was on estrogen birth control forever and didn't have clots. And she thinks that she needs more for other symptoms. She's low with everything and is 54. Okay. Does that, Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess that I'm wondering what the question is. Um, I mean, if you're on pellet HRT now, we would need to know, what is specifically in your pellet if you decide that you want to take um, Winona's HRT as well. We want to make sure that we're not doubling up on your hormones. So usually I ask patients that are transitioning from a pellet to our medication what they're actually getting in their current pellet. 
if it's only a testosterone pellet, you're still a, a candidate to do estrogen and progesterone with us. We would probably want to stay away from the DHEA though, because what happens is we use DHEA as a way to supplement with testosterone. Testosterone is technically a controlled substance in the United States. So it's regulated and you can't prescribe it via telemedicine. You have to have an in-person visit in order to do that. So the way we get around that is by prescribing DHEA. And this supplement is a hormone precursor that when your body metabolizes it and breaks it down, it gets broken down into estrogen and testosterone. So it's a way for us to give you testosterone supplementation without actually prescribing testosterone. So if you're already on a testosterone pellet, we wouldn't want to give you any more because then you could start getting deepening of your voice, facial hair <laughs> and male pattern balding if you get too much testosterone in your system. So you don't want those masculinizing side effects. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like she's typing something to us, but um, it's not here yet. So in the meantime, uh, Amy, it, we'll answer the rest of whatever you're going to tell us in one second. We'll circle back to you as you're typing. Um, let me go back to our uh, to the questions. Oh, wait. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, she's saying she's on progesterone, oral, and testosterone pellet only. No estrogen at all. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, pardon me while we, <laughs> I lost my spot. Sorry, everybody. Hang tight. Let me scroll back up here. I had to scroll all the way to the bottom to, to read the reply. Um, okay. Uh, we have, um, Jen who says she has significant unwanted facial hair in addition to several perimenopause symptoms. And she wants to know if HRT and DHEA will help. Yes. Typically the unwanted facial hair is due to hormonal changes. And so typically the estrogen will help with that. Um, and so most of my patients that notice that notice that it, the appearance, especially some of the unwanted facial hair, if it's anything that I've experienced, um, normally it's like chin hairs. A lot of women in perimenopause develop. You'll see us kind of twiddling our chins and it's not because we're in deep thought. It's because we felt a new hair, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So um, like, oh, look at that right there. Like, yes. and so it tends to be coarse. It tends to kind of stick out like a sore thumb. You know, we notice it right away. We're trying to pluck it and do what we can to remove it. Um, <laughs> you have like your travel tweezers in your purse too. So that when you're like yeah. out, you'll be like, hold on. <laughs> yes. And you know, you have a close friend when they'll tell you that you have one and you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you're like, it's right but there. Yeah, HRT generally reduces the, the thickness of those coarse hairs and it can help to reduce the appearance of new ones. Now, once you start to get unwanted hair growth in areas, the only way to really prevent that is with permanent hair removal. So like taking hormones doesn't completely reverse it, but it can prevent it from getting worse and actually change the, the quality and the thickness of the hairs. Okay, good question. Um, all right. Um, okay. Somebody is saying, um, Gina, she stopped using Winona because her primary care provider said she could get the cream cheaper through a different pharmacy. Her symptoms returned almost felt worse and has been back on Winona for three weeks and the symptoms have resolved. Thanks to Dr. Green, uh, for the help and Winona for being available. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's a great, um, this happens too. Also, I've had a couple of friends who thought that they could leave and get it cheaper at their regular OBGYN. And, you know, obviously we don't know what you get when you're not at Winona, but we know what you do get when you're with Winona. And usually people tend to circle back to us. Like at least yes. people I know, they come back. In fact, today I, I've had three patients today that had stopped treatment, you know, within the last year and they are back because they've tried other things and it just didn't work as well for them. So yep 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 nope that's good jen it's okay i have a <laughs> i have the same problem i auto dictate things and my phone makes a whole mess of things we understood your your questions thank you um okay uh somebody's asking yes please help for, with the horrible and rapid weight at your belly um we feel you we understand <laughs> um rochelle how long should you be on HRT? Her doctor told her she should not be on it more than a year. Hmm. 
a year seems awfully short. So generally, our general rule of thumb is that we want you on the HRT for the shortest amount of time that you need it. Most patients tend to be on HRT for two to three years, sometimes more. Um, generally, it's when your symptoms are the worst that we tend to start the HRT. And then when you're ready and you want to try to go off of it, we can stop the medication and see how you do. And if your symptoms return and they seem like they're just as bad as they were before, that means your body's not quite ready to come off. So we can try this, you know, periodically to try to go off the medication and see how you do. Most of my patients tend to be on it, you know, three to five years for the benefits. And I'll tell you, most OBGYN physicians, female OBGYN physicians, we joke because like when I've been at conferences and talked about HRT with other colleagues, we always say that you're going to have to peel our HRT out of our cold dead hands because we love it so much and it's so beneficial. We don't really ever want to stop it. Um, so that's that's a, an interesting view on it too. Like a lot of women don't want to stop it because they feel so good on it. Hmm, this is a good question. Lori wants to know, um, can a patient with a history of colon cancer be a candidate for HRT? You absolutely can. Yes. So HRT actually can be preventative for colon cancer. So there's, there's no increased risk for patients that have a history of colon cancer and starting HRT. So you can, you can take it. Okay. Uh, this, that's a very good, uh, that's a good question. I think some people lump cancer, all the cancers into like, if you've had cancer, any kind, then it's like you can't take HRT, but it's mostly prohibitive for reproductive type cancers, right? Or breast cancer. Yes. You know, and another thing too, that we worry about for patients is if you've had a blood clot in the legs or the lungs before, um, you know, that's something that with that history, taking hormones can increase your risk of recurrence for that. So generally, if you've had a DVT, which is a blood clot in the leg or a, a PE or pulmonary embolus, which is a blood clot in the lungs, those are two conditions that we wouldn't want you to take HRT. So, all right, that's good. Oh, um, my daughter came to say hello. Hello. You're live. There's like 26 women on here listening to mommy answer them questions. Okay. Hi. Can you let me finish? She's like, oh, <laughs> listen, what's going on over here? <laughs> she came to show me her tablet because I gave my, my two smaller kids their tablets so they would leave me alone. And, and she oh. came to show me that the downtime came on. So oh. she needs she needs extra time. I will add extra time. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, I will do it for you too. <laughs> Your kids are like, what about me? I want that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Angela, not me, but another Angela would like to know if you can comment on an overly high sex hormone binding globulin while on testosterone, HRT, and estrogen progesterone cream. How can the SHBG become more normalized? So the first thing I have to say is that getting hormone labs while you're actually taking hormones makes those hormone labs completely not legitimate. So, you know, that's one of the things out there that like a lot of providers will try to check hormone labs to see if they need to adjust your dose. Um, but really, once you're taking hormones, it can change the values of all those hormone labs. And also the hormone labs themselves can be unpredictable. They can vary from day to day or even throughout the day. So really, I wouldn't put any significant significance on that level because you're already taking HRT. It could be making that level falsely elevated. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. What I would be more concerned with is how do you feel on your current HRT? Like, is it helping your symptoms? Are you noticing side effects? That's more important than checking any labs. Okay. That's a good, it's a good thing to know. All right. Aaron is the person from the, <laughs> the Melton the Realty Group. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. <laughs> That's super funny. Um, okay. Uh, Angela says she's been on estradiol for about three months. 50 years old, uterus and ovaries and fallopian tubes removed, feeling better and wondering if DHEA would be a smart addition to help get the mental belly under control. I, I think it's a good adjunct to HRT. I think that adding the DHEA is a good complement because the DHEA, not only will it help you know with your metabolism, but it helps with your energy. 
Um, it can also help with libido as well because of the, the conversion into testosterone when it's processed in your body. So I think it will help. I think it would help with your meno belly. I think it would help with weight loss. Okay. Uh, Amy, Amy is telling us her history. I think I don't recall her question above. I know she had a, I think she had a longer question. I would have to scroll back up to see it. I'm sorry. Uh, Amy is telling us though that her history is that she's 54 years old, menopausal, uh, no thyroid, osteopenia on Fosamax weekly, IUD, Mirena, also progesterone every night, oral, along with HRT, testosterone pellet every 12 weeks. She's factor five, but never had strokes or blood clots. Her sister had testosterone pellet with estrogen. She's factor five, but they put her on it anyway. So she wants to know if she could add the patch. She takes enough pills and has tried the creams and she needs help. Yes. I mean, so it sounds like if you're only taking testosterone and progesterone, you're missing a key part of the equation, which is adding back estrogen into your system. And the other thing, I mean, she's mentioning factor five. So many, a lot of the other patients on here may not be familiar with that. So factor five Leiden is a genetic mutation that some women can carry and men can carry as well. Um, that can lead to a hypercoagulable or, or an increased risk of clotting in the blood. Um, but there's several different forms of it. You can either have one copy of the gene or two copies of the gene. But if you've never actually had a blood clot, you've ne it's never affected you in that way, then you're still a candidate to go on HRT. So I have many patients that throughout their lifetime, you know, with, with Actor 5 Light and have been on birth control um, and birth control hormones are much higher doses than HRT is. The HRT in low doses is safe, especially if you've not had a blood clot before. Okay. Awesome. That's helpful to know too. What, so people know what Factor 5 is. I know a lot of people in the, <laughs> in the chat are probably like, what is that? What is that? Yeah. It's good to know. You feel like you're outside of the conversation, right? So yay. We're all learning today. Thank you for that. <laughs> Melissa wants to know how does using HRT cream compare to Clamara pro patch in dosages? Well, so Clamara pro is basically an estrogen patch and the pro part of it stands for progesterone. So typically, um, you know, that's an estrogen and progesterone patch. So the, the difference is the cream is a compounded cream that also contains estrogen and progesterone. It's just a different vehicle to apply the medication. So, you know, the Clamara is a, is a drug company produced, you know, FDA approved medication, whereas, you know, our cream is something that we're making in our pharmacy specific for patients. So that's the big difference. Um, and, and really, you know, there's no one medication that's superior to another. I tend to think that bioidentical hormones tend to work better in your system because they're closer to what your body naturally makes on its own compared to synthetic hormones that are created in a lab. Um, but if you get a medication that works for you and is helping your symptoms, there's no reason to, to change or to switch to something else if it's working for you. Okay. All right. Um, Courtney says it's wonderful to see you again. And her question is, is of course, there's a patient of mine I actually took care of in person. Hi, oh, Courtney. She wants to know if you have a list of doctors that have additional education regarding perimenopause, menopause, postmeno. She's not having luck with finding a good OB that's even willing to talk about HRT because they think she's too young to experience perimenopause symptoms. Gotcha. So the main place that I usually send patients to, um, there's, we have a, a menopause society in the United States. It's called NAMS or the North American Menopause Society. And on their website, if you just search NAMS.org, I think it is, um, or it might be menopause.org, there's a section on their website in the top right where it has like a link where you can click find a provider. And so you could click that, put in your zip code and get a list of menopause um, providers in your area that are well-versed in menopause, that are you know, comfortable treating it. Um, and so that, that would be a good search tool to be able to use as well. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, someone's saying they notice major mood increase when they do kettlebell workouts. Yeah, it's good to do the weightlifting. Okay. Um, Not only that, but when you lift weights, like you, you carry your body differently. I feel like the stronger that you become, the more confident you get, you become too. That's true. I mean, I just started doing workout classes like 
it's like hit circuit training and it's a makes a big difference for me and i was super super sore when i started i couldn't even walk up my staircase i was like oh my god <laughs> and i was just like why have i not been doing this because i used to work out all the time and then i just stopped but anyway it was rude awakening for about a week or so but now that i'm doing it again it's really good you do feel better like even Absolutely. if it's like, you do you do start to feel like oh yeah like i can do this like it's okay I, I got this i can do it and your body does start to respond it takes a minute it's also like oh wait those muscles are there <laughs> where have you been yeah so i think it's a, a nice bonus for for your confidence like the boost of of self-esteem you get from doing something that might feel challenging or hard um but also i think you do see the the physical effects of it over time right you do start absolutely to yeah yeah it's nice um okay let's see am i gonna say this right halicu i hope i'm pronouncing your name right i'm on the patch and pills at night if i'm still if i'm still having occasional sweats should i ask for a dose increase well, it all depends on how, how far into your treatment you are. So if you just started treatment and it's been like three to four weeks, I would give it a little bit more time before we change the dose. Generally, we want to try to give the dose a chance for two to three months before we make wholesale changes. Unless you are noticing absolutely no improvement, then, then we might want to increase it sooner. So it depends on where you are in your treatment course, but you can certainly message your Winona doctor um, and let them know what you're experiencing and you can talk through it with them. Okay. Um, the next question. Um, Lily had a partial hysterectomy five years ago and has one ovary left and she wants to know how will she know when she's going into perimenopause? She says she's starting to see the belly weight gain and she's 47 and doesn't know when she needs to start getting help. Well, really without a uterus, you can't go by the menstrual changes, right? To know like when you're actually nearing the menopausal transition there. But um, the best way to do this is to start monitoring your body for symptoms. And we have a, don't we have a symptom tracker, Angela? We Maybe do. We can link it for them, for the patients that are on the call. Cause I think that by far, like taking a symptom diary and starting to track how you're feeling over time, whether or not you're putting a note in your phone or whether it's something hard copy, like I still have a little planner that I use. It's like a peripheral brain for me um, that I still use readily. But, um, you know, any kind of symptom tracker I think would be good um, because then you can actually see over time. We, we tend to get used to little changes until suddenly there are big changes. And then all of a sudden it seems like it all kind of accumulates for us. But I think that um, if you're starting to see the belly weight gain, that's part of it. If your sleep is starting to get disordered or you're starting to notice any other changes like with your mood or with um, you know, your response um, sexually as far as like vaginal lubrication, vaginal dryness, I think these are all signs that it could be starting um, and it might be time to get help if you're starting to notice those things. Okay, well, I'm gonna put this link in the chat. I just wanted to make sure before I popped it in here that it was still the right link. Sometimes we update things. <laughs> and I wanted to make sure I'm not giving you all a dead link, but it is definitely something you can use. I know people ask and, and we will get there. So all the people who use Winona or want to use Winona, we are hoping to have a digital version of this. Like right now you have to download it. So sorry about that part. So for those of you who don't have a printer, you might be like, oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you have one, print it out or ask your friend to print it out. It's helpful for those of you who like to actually write things down. But we will have a good digital version that you can just, you know, auto populate at some point in the near future. Uh, sorry, Jen. Yes, I know. I feel the same. I was like, why is this not? Why is this not friendly for me to type in on my computer um, or on my phone? But I think um, that's what we have. It is helpful. Um, even if you, you know, I don't know if it'll allow you to copy and paste it into something that you could type into, like in your notes or something, Jen, maybe um, give it a try. I haven't tried that, but, you know, see, see if that's possible. Um, but it is helpful, I think, you know, to get a, get an idea about what you're dealing with. Okay, so let me go back here and see who we missed. Sorry. 
uh, da, 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 da. why are doctors against HRT? Yeah, why are they against HRT? <laughs> <laughs> The main reason is because there was a really poorly done study many years ago that was widely published and, and really um, all the findings were put in the media everywhere. And it was the WHI or the Women's Health Initiative study. Um, and and as, you, as we as clinicians kind of get into the weeds and looking at how the study was done and some of the things they did, the way that they prescribed HRT in the study wasn't good. Um, they were giving HRT to women that maybe weren't good candidates and starting it much later than we would recommend. And then they, they put all this outcomes data out, basically talking about how dangerous it was, how dangerous hormones were. And as a result, the pendulum swung prior, prior to the study, HRT was pretty well utilized widely. And then after the study, suddenly doctors stopped prescribing because they were afraid of the published results from the study. Even though the study has been scrutinized time and time again, and, and has been shown, like we've had other studies since then that have contradicted what they've published. There's still like a stigma that has followed it. And as a result, medical students are not learning, you know, how to prescribe HRT. Even in my residency in OBGYN, I remember my professors and, and the doctors that attendings that were teaching me telling me, well, just memorize this for the test. You're never going to use it. You know, just, just know about these things, but you're never going to use this because we don't, we don't do hormones anymore. Um, but ultimately it really comes down to, it's a huge gender disparity. You know, women were not included in a lot of research and a lot of research has gone into men, erectile dysfunction, men's experience of heart disease and heart attacks. Um, and, and it's really because people just didn't care about women's experiences. And so now for us to be speaking up as women and demanding treatment and starting to change the tide. And, and now there's more and more providers that are willing to prescribe. There's dozens of, of doctors on social media now trying to educate about menopause. So there's, there's more and more information out there. And I think that um, things are changing, you know, the, the tide is changing because women are demanding help. Well, thank goodness for that. Yes. <laughs> it's a time. Um, yeah, the disparity is massive, and I'm going to not say anything else because I have a soapbox I'll be on for the rest of the <laughs> Everyone will be like, shh, lady leading this, be quiet. Um, <laughs> Cynthia wants to, uh, to ask the question about uh, paroxetine. She says, have you heard of using paroxetine for night sweats? Can it be combined with estrogen for patients older than 60? Good question. Well, so a lot of SSRIs, which paroxetine is one of those, you know, these are antidepressants that are used. Um, many doctors will often prescribe antidepressants for menopausal symptoms, especially, you know, hot flashes or night sweats. Um, they're not as effective as HRT. Um, but if, if you have a need for those medications for another reason, like if you have a history of depression or anxiety, they absolutely are safe to take with HRT. Um, in my opinion, I, I only personally would recommend using those medications if someone's not a good candidate for hormones, because by far, hormones are the most effective treatment for these symptoms. And, you know, the paroxetine or the Effexor, Prozac, they're just not going to be as effective in treating these symptoms. They might treat them partially, but they're not going to give you ultimate relief like HRT would. That's also super helpful. See, I didn't know that. I mean, I know that there's a lot of crossover drug prescribing for different things, but mm -hmm. that's interesting to know that that doctors want to throw that at you for. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, it, I think it's it's kind of it makes me angry because, you know, when you think about it, women come and they're complaining about symptoms and they're talking about how they're feeling and the brain fog and they're talking about mood swings and hot flashes. And when the answer from a physician or a provider is, oh, let me give you an antidepressant, to me that equals, I think you're crazy. This is all in your head. Here, let me give you a medication to make your head better, which really is not the answer, right? So I, a lot of our patients come to Winona and I see you know, antidepressants in their med list um, and often many of them were just started on them in their perimenopause journey. Um, I've also had a lot of patients that are started on ADHD medication because the brain fog of perimenopause is making them have a hard time multitasking and, and doing things and prioritizing things. But it's really the loss of estrogen from our brain and how it's affecting our neurotransmitters. It's not actually, you know, developing ADHD late in life in the mid forties. It's, it's very rare to develop that late in life. So. 
Oh, I can't hear you, Angela, for some reason. Oh, I can't hear you at all now. Uh-oh, what happened? We lost your audio. Are you typing? Oh, you heard standby. Okay. Well, let me go back and see where we left off for the questions and I can read the question. <laughs> Let's see until we figure out your sound. Uh, let's see. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So somebody said, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. I guess that was around the time he stepped out. Um, Mira asked that her doctor just ordered blood work to get an idea of when she'll start menopause and she wants to look at the hormone levels. Would Winona take the results into consideration? So the important thing about this is that there are no real good labs that are predictors of when you're going to start menopause. So many physicians will order hormone labs because that's what they think they need to do. Um, they'll order estrogen, they'll order progesterone, they may order testosterone levels or what we call an FSH or fo uh, follicle stimulating hormone. But these hormone levels are not very predictable as far as letting us know when you're going to go through menopause. They can be helpful. Um, maybe I, I just heard a sound from you. Can you hear me? I hear you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I just heard like a click sound. So I'm like, you're back. It was a weird default. I was like looking here and it, it it hit up Microsoft Teams microphone and I don't even have that. So I don't know what happened, but oh. hello. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going. glad you're back. Thank you. Well, so anyway, hormone levels are not very um, reliable to help us to know like when you're going to go through menopause. The only time a hormone level is helpful to me is if I want to know if someone has completed menopause, like maybe they don't have their uterus anymore. And I want to know, are they done? you know, have they finished menopause, a follicle stimulating hormone when it's really, really elevated can tell me that. But that's a after the fact, more for like, you know, my own educational purposes to figure out if they finished. But we we're happy to look at labs if you really want us to look at something that you've already had drawn. But it's actually best for us to base the treatment based on your symptoms and your symptom profile, um, and how long your symptoms have been going on and base your treatment on that and base your dosage on that rather than looking at labs to change or adjust dosage. Amy, I'm responding to your glasses comment. <laughs> um, so Maria said she had to drop away from the call briefly and think she missed the answer to her question. Maria, will you retype your question in the chat? Because I don't recall skipping your question, but since you're here, Put it in the chat and we'll answer it if you're still here. Um, and then somebody asked about benign brain tumors. Wait, I'm scrolling. Where are you? Mira. Mm, Mira, I, what? I answered her question about the hormone levels, but it looks like she followed up with, is it the same uh, for with the history of brain tumors? I don't know if that's, you know, is it the same compared to colon cancer? So if you've had a benign tumor removed from your body somewhere and it was not cancerous, then you're still a candidate for HRT if it was a benign mass. Yeah. Um, we have some other comments just about prior, prior comments to our conversation around why doctors are against HRT um, and, and our, our hair conversation about skin hair. Um, okay. I'm just making sure we're not skipping anything. Um, Jen, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> um, when we, okay, Sabrina says, when we say cream, where are we applying this? She just wants to make sure she's getting the right picture. Mm -hmm. So for the cream, our body cream, it just has to be applied on a part of the body that's a non hair bearing part. So for most women, it tends to be the inner forearm. So like right in here. So if you have your cream, you can dispense it right on your forearm. And then what I normally would do is take the two forearms and rub them together. 
that's just how I usually recommend. But I've had some patients that, you know, are concerned about it rubbing off or maybe, you know, they don't like the feeling of a cream on their forearm. So I've had patients apply it to the inner part of the, the back of the knee um, mm-hmm. or the inner thighs. You just have to apply it to a non hair bearing part. And you typically don't want to apply it to the breast or to the face. Um, you know, typically you want to go somewhere else. Did that, have you ever had somebody be like, I put it on my face? Well, because <laughs> There's all these companies now that are selling these other estrogen face creams. And so I think that women feel like they're going to get more bang for their buck and they'll start rubbing on their face. But it's not, it's not meant to go on the face. Um, and so oh my God. <laughs> sorry if anyone in the chat has done that. I have like just visually picturing like, how does that go? Um, but I, mean, I guess it kind of makes sense, right? I, I don't know. But yeah, not advocating for that, but I could get where maybe you might. Um, okay, let's see. Rochelle says, is it okay to take estrogen or other herbal menopause supplements? So it's okay as, as far as safety if you're taking something that doesn't contain estrogens in it. So if you're, if you're taking HRT, you want to remove any other source of estrogens from your supplements. So You know, some of the Estroven products, um, if you look at the ingredients list, some of them actually list that they have phytoestrogens. Um, And so in that sense, like it's plant estrogens that are, you know, in the supplement. So you don't, you wouldn't want to do those, but I think that a lot of their supplements don't have that. But like Dr. Green and I were talking about earlier, sometimes, you know, when you start the HRT and you're feeling better on it, you realize that you may not need these other herbal supplements, they might not be as helpful to you when you actually have the real deal and the the gold standard treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Maria, I think has typed in her question, but wait, Um, I want to make sure I'm not skipping something. Okay. Let's go back up to Tanya for a sec. Tanya is asking, this is a good, we get asked this a lot. She says she was, thinks she was misdiagnosed with anxiety and it might be hormone deficiency related. And she wants to know, how do you prescribe without labs? So we prescribe based on an algorithm. Actually, Dr. Green came up with the algorithm as our chief medical officer. He was the first doctor working at Winona. And, you know, what we came up with was an algorithm that takes into account patient's symptom profile, but also their age and their BMI. So it takes all that information and it kind of gives us an estimated dose of where we want to start. And sometimes it works great for patients. Often we might have to tweak it a little bit, but it's a good place to start so that we know, you know, um, where to begin with someone's treatment. Generally, as a physician, I want to start on the lower side of things. I don't want to give somebody a high dose if they don't need to because it can lead to side effects. So we tend to start with a conservative or a low dose and then adjust as needed to get your symptoms under better control. Okay. And really, like, I can tell what hormones are deficient based on your symptoms. So, you know, if someone has hot flashes and night sweats and vaginal dryness, those are all evidence that their estrogen is low. Someone's having problems sleeping, that can also tell me their progesterone is low as well. So we we know that just based on our experience in, in treating patients with these things. That's fantastic. That's also very helpful information, I think, because a lot of people think you have to have labs. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't. Um, okay. R- Rochelle says, wow, that's, so that's why my lab said I had normal hormones, but I hadn't had a period for more than a year. My doctor seemed to think I wasn't in, peri- in menopause yet, but I sure felt like it. So I went ahead with HRT with you guys. Yes. Congratulations <laughs> on listening to your own instincts. Um, that's good. Maria. Okay. This is her question. The person who thought she's was skipped. Uh, she says, um, she's 55 and not fully into menopause yet, although is experiencing a lot of symptoms of perimenopause and wanted to know if it's okay to be starting HRT with us before actual menopause. And she's considered a risk for breast cancer because her mother had it three times, including estrogen receptor type of cancer and wondered if Winona therapy is safe to take in that case. Yes. So we did talk about this a little earlier, but yes, Taking the hormones and starting HRT before you actually are completed menopause is actually just fine. You you should start taking it when your symptoms are bothersome because the, the decline in our hormones is not like a sudden drop that happens overnight. 
You know, the symptoms can start to develop for up to a decade before our periods finally finish. And those symptoms and the hormone levels are decreasing over that time too. So as you start to develop symptoms, you can start supplementing with HRT before you're actually menopausal. In fact, I mean, you get more benefit the earlier you start the HRT than waiting. And then also for the second part of the question, family history of breast cancer does not preclude you from being able to be a candidate for HRT. So even if it was an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer or, you know, that, that sort of thing in your family members, you're, you're still a good candidate for HRT. Awesome. Okay. I think we have only one, maybe possibly two questions left. Uh, Emily says, what are some of the best dietary changes to make during perimenopause? Well, my number one advice for dietary or nutrition changes is to only eat when you're hungry. I think that many of us get into the busyness of our lives and we eat because it's mealtime or we eat because of other reasons. I don't know if many of you are, are victim of that, but you know, we tend to eat socially. We tend to eat when we're stressed. We tend to eat when we're upset. But if you really pay attention to when you actually feel hunger um, and only eat when you're hungry, and really pay attention to how foods make you feel when you eat them. So try to focus on fresh fruits and vegetables. Try to stay on the periphery of a grocery store rather than the inside, you know, where all the things are shelf stable. Um, because all those foods have so many preservatives and so many things that are not great for you. So stay with things that are perishable or that can go bad um, because they tend to be the most nutrient dense Um and so there's a lot of information out there on, you know, berries being very full of antioxidants and having good um, benefits for your health, but green leafy vegetables too. Making sure you get a lot of fiber in your diet in, in midlife is really important as well, not only for bowel regularity, but also just, just for overall gut health too is really important. Um, and the other part that I, I noticed that a lot of women aren't getting enough of, especially when they're trying to lose the meno belly and trying to lose weight is they're not getting enough protein in their diet. And so that's something that, um, you know, we probably all eat less protein than we probably need to maintain our muscle strength and our muscle mass. Um, one of the ways I do it, I actually have one sitting here because I was drinking one before, is this is the way I get extra protein, is these Fair Life shakes. Um, soy is something that is good. Somebody just added that. What about soy? You know, soy can be helpful too. Um, and some people worry because they say if they eat too much soy, either, you know, isoflavones or estrogen like compounds in soy, but you'd have to eat a hell of a lot of soy to get too much, too much estrogen like compounds from it. So, but adding protein in your diet is important too. And staying well hydrated. I think yeah. so many of us don't drink enough water. Yes. That's why I was sitting it's on the you put some hydration packs in here. I, since perimenopause, I put the hydration IV packs in all of my water because at night I was getting like this excessive dry mouth. And I was like, what is going on? Like, just t like, and I've never been a person that needs to wake up in the middle of the night to drink water. And I was kind of like, what? So now that's like a part of life. I just put hydration packs in all the works i don't know how come suddenly i was like dehydrated but there you go i don't know is dry mouth a common thing in perimenopause Dr. i Cass? think it i think it can be and i have a lot of women that talk about having like a strange taste in their mouth too and like yes. strange odors sometimes like a i hear from patients saying that like their their sweat has changed its scent um you know their nose that like we tend to be a little bit more sensitive to smells as our hormones are changing yeah. And that can be common, you know, anytime you have hormone changes. I remember when I was pregnant, I like felt like I had a nose like a hound dog. Yeah. <laughs> My sister had that as well. She was like, I can't eat some of the same foods or like body washes or things that were like fragrant. She was like, uh -uh, no, can't, can't have it. But, um, okay. One last question is, is it better to stay away from caffeine? Well, I think anything in moderation is okay. So... Caffeine, actually, coffee can, has some health benefits as long as you're not having too much of it. You know, getting too much caffeine can cause problems like heart palpitations and, and issues like that. But, but generally, anything in moderation is okay, in my opinion. Now, if your coffee means like more like milk and lots of sweeteners and a little bit of coffee, right? maybe not so good. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, well... I think it's important to like, I mean, yeah, 
and just pay attention to your body, right? Like as you get older, you start noticing things that weren't there before. Yes. So just don't, you know, we're our own best judge. I think like, you know, yes, doctors know lots of things and you should check with them, but also don't gaslight yourself. Like if you experience something, it's real, you know, yeah. so be sure and Oh, the other thing too about the dietary changes, the other thing we might want to mention is that there's a lot of foods that can, and drinks that can make your hot flashes and your night sweats worse. Things like that I love, like, you know, some good cheeses and some chocolate and some red wine. <laughs> you, know, you may notice in perimenopause that you're not able to drink as much alcohol as you maybe were in the past, that it exacerbates your hot flashes. Um, and so pay attention to that because that, I mean, that's your body telling you that it doesn't like it. So, um, you may have to change those habits here and there, you know, to, to make your symptoms a little bit more tolerable. Yeah. Thank you everyone for your questions. We're happy you're here. Happy you showed up. Tell your friends <laughs> come every month. There's a, a Winona party online and possibly coming to a city near you in the future. <laughs> We're trying to do some live meetups. So maybe you can let us know where you would like us to come do something live and in person in your state. Um, yes. You know, tempting to see all of you at some point. And also don't be afraid. I mean, get on, if you're on social media to follow the Winona um, accounts on, on all the social media feeds, we often share educational content on there. Um, and so that's a good place to sometimes learn additional stuff. And then we also have educational information on our website too. That's free for patients to access and, and our one on a journal that's on our webpage. So there's a lot of articles about different topics that you, if you want to read more and learn more, there's, there's information for you there as well. That's right. There sure is. And if I can get my act together, I will put the links here in the chat for those of you who <laughs> who don't know um because i think we're you know we have a lot of we're on every platform we are on facebook instagram youtube um tiktok tiktok dr cat is also on the, hey you guys should follow dr cat hold on on instagram <laughs> and that's her handle you know Winona. By Winona is our handle on everything. Go to any platform, put in by Winona, you'll find us. I cannot find my list of links in a hurry. So sorry, everybody. I'll be prepared next time. I have my notes section open and it's all, all of it is labeled. And of course, I can't find the one page that I need. So it's okay. But if they just go on the site, if you just go to bywinona.com and you click on like some of the, the links at the top, I think you can get to it that way too. That's right. It's on the social is on um, it's on our website. Yes, that's also a solid point, Dr. Kat. <laughs> it's everywhere, technically. Mm -hmm. And if you get our emails, it's on the bottom of all of our emails. You know, we we love for you to, uh, you know, follow us, engage with us. Um, and if you aren't already and you want to, please join our women's group on Facebook. It's free to you. You just have to request to join. Um, and I'm sure most of you know about the women's group, but if you don't, you should. Um, it's just called Winona Women. And um, if my computer hadn't logged me out of every single program, <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't have to log back into all of them right now would throw that in the chat as well. But um, yeah, I definitely think, you know, if you want to look at what we're doing, where we are, what types of things we're doing in the media, you can also find that out about us. Um, I do have that link, of course, because that's top of mind. But for whatever reason, the list of social handles, you can definitely check out the replay of this on YouTube. Um, but it usually takes about a week. So give us a little bit of time because we like to segment out some of these questions that you all ask and we reshare it with everybody so that if you have questions you can go back and listen to the full episode we'll pick out the ones that we think are great and we'll share it on social but um join us again next month um we'll be doing more of this taking your questions dr cat me dr green um so come back and see us we want to hang out with you Dr. Kat, any closing words? Just 
be your own advocate. Knowledge is power. So thanks for coming out tonight and answer and asking your questions and, and learning more, because I think that's the best way we can take care of ourselves is by learning as much as we can. Yep, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a really good night and we will see you next month. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.